Hello, today is Friday, October 16th, 2015, and I am your host, Sue Brown, and welcome to Info to Rail, your freight train to modern media. How y'all doing today? Well, this is two of two interviews for this day, and I'll tell you, it has been an absolute fun first interview. So on to the second one, and I'm hoping we're going to have a lot of fun. We have a great show in store for you today. We're very fortunate to have Dream Expert Kelly Sullivan Walden with us today. I'm looking very forward to this. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. We all dream, so hey. Um, first, we're going to have a little glimpse into the missing persons files. The first one is a miss, missing Washington mother of three, maybe suffering from postpartum depression. Elizabeth Pham, age 33, of Centralia, Washington, was last seen on Saturday, October 10th, 2015. Elizabeth left her vehicle on southbound I-5 near MP-59 in Toledo Saturday morning, unlocked with the keys inside, and walked to GC's truck stop where she had a taxi driver take her to the Shell station at exit 59. Witnesses say that she then walked to Beasley Restaurant, where she placed an order. From there, a witness reported seeing a woman later in the day matching Elizabeth's description sitting under an overpass at exit 59, staring into... Cowlitz River. On Sunday, a makeup bag identified as Elizabeth's was turned into Castle Rock Police Department after a fisherman located it, in, it down the river from the area Elizabeth was last seen. I pray to God that she is still alive and safe, but this doesn't look good, guys. Elizabeth is 5'6", 122 pounds, has blonde hair and blue eyes. She was last seen wearing a red and pink top purple pajama bottoms, and socks. Please, you guys, anybody with any information, call your local 911. And I pray, I pray for, to, for her family members to bring them closure and that she is safe. Um, the next one is Fine Kyria. Um, this is an Illinois boy. Kyria Knox, age two, was last seen in Rockford, Illinois, in the care of a family friend prior to his disappearance. The exact date Kyria went missing is unknown, but presumably sometime in August or September of 2015. Kyria is described as approximately 30 inches tall, 35 pounds, has low-cut black hair and brown eyes. Anyone with any information on this little boy's location, please contact the Rockford, Illinois Police Department police department at 815-987-5824 or call Crime Stoppers at 815-963-7867. That's very unfortunate and a lot of times these young kids like this end up getting all scrambled up and you know with all these custody battles and stuff like that and I feel so bad because the kids just they don't deserve to be yanked back and forth between anybody. You know if you got children and they end up being in a situation like that, you should do the best you can for the child without having to put them through anything. So I pray to the good Lord that this little boy is brought home safe and sound where he belongs. We're going to take a short break, and when we return, we're going to have Kelly Sullivan Walden with us. Stay tuned. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Okay, we are back with Kelly Sullivan Walden. Kelly is on a mission to awaken the world to the power of dreams. Known as America's premier dream expert, she is the number one best-selling author of I Had the Strangest Dream and It's All in Your Dreams, Dream Oracle Cards, and the newly released Chicken Soup for the Soul, Dreams and Premonitions. She is also a certified clinical hypno hypnotherapist, inspirational speaker, and founder of Dream Life Coach Training. Kelly has reached millions of people with her inspiring message on national talk shows such as Dr. Oz, Ricky Lake, the Real, Bethany, Huffington Post Live, Coast to Coast, and Fox News. And now she will be on Info to Rail. Hello, Kelly, and thank you for being with us on Info to Rail today. It's such a pleasure to be with you, Sue. Thank you for having me. Can you start out by telling our listeners a little bit about you and what you do and how you got started in this? Sure. I have been fascinated by dreams since I was a little girl. I have four sisters, and I have one sister that's closest to me in age. Her name's Shannon, and we shared a bedroom growing up, and we also shared a lot of dreams. We we were in each other's dreams. We, we would understand the dream characters in each other's dreams, and 
that became a, a source of fascination for both of us and interest. So paying attention to dreams on a regular basis was something that it was just very natural. It was like a fish swimming in water. Didn't think it was a big deal, um, although I thought it was a lot of fun. Didn't know that there was any therapeutic value, but I just thought that was a really great thing to do. So it became a habit. And um, as I grew older, I found that dreams became a source of navigational guidance with my relationships. One of the stories I write about at the in the introduction to the Chicken Soup for the Soul Dreams and Premonitions book is how I allowed dreams to reveal I was dating a guy that I thought I would marry. He was perfect on paper, and I had a dream that I was in the future with him, and I had become a zombie. And I was like, I was just dead inside. Even though everything was perfect on the outside, it was like a Stepford experience. And and I knew that if we went any further, that it wasn't going to go well. So I used that guidance to um, to make decisions in my relationship. And then, and then later, when I met my husband, who was everything wrong on paper, he was, you know, on on many different levels. He just wasn't my ideal guy who I thought I would be with on paper. Anyway, he was in a complicated relationship. He was older than I was. He, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that I didn't think my family would approve of. And yet he was in my dream. I got a, a dream about um, all these dragonflies that I knew were related to him. And sure enough, I did marry him and we've been together for 15 years now and it's been amazing. And I'm not a zombie. So um, my dreams have been a really powerful source of guidance for me. Twenty years ago, though, I became a certified clinical hypnotherapist and began working with dreamers and their dreams. And because of the subconscious mind, which is what we focus on as, sub- as a hypnotherapist, that dreams of other people became a source of fascination for me. And it seemed that people were enjoying my point of view when I would give them my take on what I thought their dreams meant. So I started to do the dream work on a professional basis. And and then when my first book came out, I had the strangest dream, the Dreamer's Dictionary for the 21st Century. Then my career in dream work really accelerated. That book took off, sold a lot of copies. I did a lot of media, and people started to know me as the dream girl or Dr. Dream. And, and um, that brings me, I've written several books since. I It's All in Your Dreams, Dreaming Heaven, Dream Oracle Cards, and then most recently, Chicken Food for the Soul, Dreams and Premonitions. And then I have another Dream Dictionary coming out next Valentine's Day. It's called the Love, Sex, and Relationship Dream Dictionary. But right now, I'm, I'm really excited about Chicken Soup for the Soul with the 101 inspiring stories of transformation via dreams. That is very fascinating. I think dreams are a very exciting thing for pretty much everybody. Um my, I think the problem I have is I don't remember all my dreams, and it frustrates me because, I mean, I know that I have another life in my dream. It's like a separate yeah. life, and I love yeah. I love being there, especially you know when you. To me, it's fascinating to find out what I'm doing in my dream life. <laughs> yeah. So I yeah, love it, is, it. I think you just nailed it. It is really like another life. It in many ways. It is. And most people don't remember that life because it's hard to remember it. And in some ways, I think it's, we we really have to go out of our way to remember it. So it's, it's not completely natural to remember dreams. It's more natural to not remember our dreams because they are so coded and strange. And if you don't go out of your way within the first three minutes after waking up, the dreams will mostly be gone. But that doesn't mean that we're not dreaming. We all dream three to five dreams every night, or three to nine dreams, I should say, every night. And we always dream. And and it does, however, become really exponentially um, life-serving when we do remember at least a part of a dream, even if we don't know what it means. There was a study done at Harvard a few years ago about the about the effects of people that remember even just one tiny little piece of a dream, even if they didn't know what it meant. And they were able to prove that it made them better problem solvers the next day. It gave them better intuition so that they were able to better navigate their lives the next day. And because of that, they had a stronger sense of confidence and well-being 
associated with that, even though they didn't necessarily know what the dream was telling them. So my, if I was going to do a science experiment, I would, I would take it up to the next level and say, well, what happens when people actually do interpret their dream? How much more navigational acuity and intuition and confidence does that give them? That, that's what I think is what I find to be actually my own experiment in a non-clinical setting is, is that it, it absolutely gives people a sense of a surge of confidence and a sense of being connected with the larger picture larger sense of life and having a sense that the world is on your side as opposed to against you. So um, there's tremendous benefits in, in paying attention to dreams. So hopefully tonight, Sue, you'll remember your dream. My father passed in October, and all my listeners know, because oh, I, I talk. Oh, wow, that was, wow, this, this no, was October no, a year ago. It's been one year. It was one year on the 9th. And oh, wow. it was the most peaceful yeah. moment after watching someone suffer that way. It was the most peaceful moment of my life just to say, you're going home. Bye bye. I don't want to see anything like that again in my life. Um, mm, my faith, wow. my faith in God is is, I think, how I made it through. Um, mm. You know, knowing that He was going to be in a better place and everything was okay. Now, right. it was either the night of His passing or the night after. I had had a dream that my father come out in the kitchen. I was standing in the kitchen and he came around the corner and I just froze and I looked at him and said, what are you doing here? You're dead. And he, he looks, he looks down at himself and he looks at me and he says, I don't look dead to me. Feel fine. Never felt better. And he goes, so, sh so shut your beak. And that's what he always said to me. Just shut your beak. And I have, your beak. I have the most closest family. My mom and dad were married 50 years. My dad was one who Failed family above everything. He took care of us better than I could ever even have asked for in this world. And, wow. you know, that was his sense of humor. But in my dream, he stood right in the kitchen and he assured me that he's not sick anymore. He feels better than he ever felt. So don't worry about wow. it. You know, oh, and that's amazing. It's something and he's alive to him because life keeps going. Life doesn't stop. It just takes a different form. Absolutely. So he's right. He is still alive. But that was like the most amazing message I've ever gotten through a dream. Wow. And oh. I ask for him to come back in my dreams a lot, and he doesn't. I mean, I'm sure he's busy. I know from a lot of the conversations I've had with afterlife people that they have things yes. going on in heaven just like we do here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it takes a lot to come through, a, a lot of concentration. And I think if there's a general sense that you're okay, like that initial visit might have really been good for you, like giving you a sense that, that he's okay. I think that's what they really want us to know. And if they are able to transmit that, then I think they, they feel that they're, they're okay to move on because it is part of their soul's agenda. I mean, it's, it would be very codependent of them to relinquish their agenda on the other side just to make sure we're okay when some people on this side will never be okay with the passing of a loved one. It's, they think that if, if it ever becomes okay, it means that you don't love them. But in fact, that's not true. My, my little experience on the other side, which was only about 15 minutes, I, all I wanted was everybody to be okay with me going. And if they were okay, I would have kept going. And I would have done so with a big smile on my ethereal face. But everyone on this side, our side of the veil, was so upset and so flipped out. I knew they, would, they wouldn't be okay for a long time, and I couldn't bear it. That's my handle. fear. That's my biggest fear in the whole world is when I don't have a fear of passing. I mean, I know yeah. how beautiful it's going to be. And when my dad went, I didn't have any kind of anguish or upset. You know, I cried because we all stood, you know, stood in one spot and watched him pass. But And it hurt me that he was gone. But what hurt me the worst was watching him suffer. But for me, right. my biggest fear is I have four girls. And I know for a fact, and they've told me that we would never be all right with you if you passed and we were this young. You know, we would never be okay. How do you live without your mom when that's all you've ever had is your mom and your grandparents? Right. And now we lost grandpa. If you left, what would we do? And I'm like, that's the only thing that bothers me about, you know, when it's my time. And I try to explain to them, you'll have to be okay when it's my time because you have to let me be in peace too. And that's, exactly, exactly. But they wouldn't be. I mean, I'm the one that... No, it would take a I, while. I raised, it would take I a raised while. them, yep. They're my girls, and I raised them by myself. And for the most part, so, I mean, besides myself, my parents were the biggest part of their lives. And when my dad passed, three of my girls were here. 
And I sent my eight-year-old to school because I did not want my eight-year-old to witness that yet. Mm. The 14-year-old, the 19-year-old, the 21-year-old, they were all right here and they watched. And for that reason, I think they're all a little bit more at peace than if it was a ah. sudden devastation that, and we didn't know it was yes. coming. Yeah, that's very true. It's very true. Well, maybe you can you can let them know. I mean, I I spend a lot of time in Mexico, in Teotihuacan, Mexico. We did a um, I'm in a documentary called Dreaming Heaven, and it's related to the book Dreaming Heaven. And we, my husband and I, spent a lot of time in the culture and learning about the Toltec way of being and their point of view about death is so very different than our point of view here. In the the children's playgrounds, like in a in a schoolyard or just kind of in a random park, they have this serpent that represents Quetzalcoatl, which is like what swallows you up when you die. So the kids will play on a slide that represents death. It's like this fun game. And they and they all know in their culture about the angel of death that comes and takes you when you go. And and the angel of death is not an enemy. It's like it's almost like this sweet person that when it's time to go, this beautiful angel is going to take you and and that's that's what what you do and and there's a lot of joy at funerals. Not that anybody's ever happy to see somebody go, but they're happy to know that for sure they have an expanded sense of reality on the other side. So they to me I think it's so valuable to as early as possible in our lives to begin to get a sense of the larger picture that we're connected to. And of course death is an emotional thing. I mean, I know when people I love die, I feel that that kick in the stomach and I feel that devastation. But I also quickly remember that there is more going on than my than my eyes can see. And because I've been there myself, so I know and I know it helps to read some of the books about it. One of the stories in the chicken soup for this whole book, may I tell this story just because I think it's Absolutely it's, kind of it's about a woman who is having a real struggle in her life and she's she wants to be an actress and she is having she just can't get a job to save her life so she's really broke financially and and really kind of downtrodden she her relationships aren't going well um kind of everything that could go wrong is going wrong and she has a dream about her best friend that had passed away 2 years before and her best friend is in the dream with her they're sitting across the table with one another and and the woman who's having the dream says, oh, my God, there you are. I've missed you so much. Oh, my God, it's so great to see you. Wait, let me tell you about my horrible life. All right, listen to this. So she tells how she, you know all the stuff that I just told you about, how awful her life was. And she goes on and on in detail. And finally, when she's done, her friend who has been patiently sitting there listening finally looks at her, stands up, and hits the table and says, but you're still alive. And the woman goes, oh, oh my God, you're right. I am <laughs> still alive. What was I thinking? Oh, my God. So these are the problems of a woman who has a life. Not only am I alive, but I have a life. I, these are quality problems. So she wakes up from that dream feeling so empowered about her problems that she wouldn't change her problems for anything because they are the stuff of her life and she's still alive and she can do something about these things. So she she proceeds about her life after that dream but with a completely different spring in her step and a different frame around the whole thing. And things do begin to change for her. Things do begin to look up for her because guess what? Her attitude is different. What do you know? So I think our, our people that love us on the other side do come in from time to time when we need them and they do give us a reassurance that that you know they give us a different perspective a wiser perspective than we might otherwise have and just like your father coming to you gave you some reassurance that he's okay you don't have to worry about him you don't have to think about him forevermore as the sick man on his deathbed it's like no 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 that was one blip one moment in time he is forever young he is happy he's he, he's joking with you just as he always did. Shut your beak. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great story. Maybe you'll submit that story for our next Chicken Soup for the Soul book, Dreams and Synchronicities. I think that would be a great story. 
Well, that was his, per- you know, his personality was, my dad made everything light. Everything was uh-huh. easygoing, laid back. And, you know, his famous words were, don't sweat the small stuff. What are you going to do about it anyway? You know, I'd say, right. it's going to snow tomorrow. And he'd say, and what are you going to do about it if it does? <laughs> you know, he says, if you can't change it, why even stress over it? Who cares? You oh, know, I love that. and it's, it was yes, it's all small stuff. <laughs> but it was so, you know, that's I'm that way in a lot of ways, and people call that passiveness or whatever. But no, you know, I, I live. Mm. You're only on this earth for how many years, and you sweat <laughs> all the small stuff, and you know, it's you worry about the stupidest things when you got a family right in front of you. Love the daylights out of them. Well, you got them because all exactly. this material stuff and all this. You know, cars and houses and money. You can't take that with you when you go. Who cares? Oh, it reminds me of another chicken soup for the soul, dreams and premonitions story. Can I tell yes, more? Yes, please share. Yes. Oh, uh, well, there, I love this story. I actually think about this one a lot. And anybody who's been married a long time or in a long-term relationship and it starts to get stale, this dream will resonate. So there's a woman who is on the outs with her husband and she's been contemplating divorce and they've been married. They have an empty nest. It's like, okay, this is a good time to get divorced. We're done. We don't have anything in common anymore. We're not nice to each other anymore. It's just gone really, really stale. So she goes to sleep that night really for sure focused that she's going to focus that she's going to get a divorce and, and proceed that the next day, but she dreams that her husband is dead and and she feels truly as if he did die. And she breaks the news to the kids, and the kids are so upset. And she, and she is moving through all of his stuff and putting his things away, and she's remembering how much she loved him. And she's feeling the emptiness of the hole that, that he would leave in his absence. And, and by the end of her dream, she's thinking, oh, my God, I really do love him. I've really been taking him for granted. God, I wish I had him back. I really wish I had him back. And she wakes up in the morning, and there he is sleeping by her side, breathing just fine. And she rolls him over. They make love. She's, <laughs> she's, and they start all over again. And their relationship had like this new beginning because of a simple dream. That is amazing. Isn't that amazing? So sometimes it's not even actually death that, that wakes us up to being alive, but just the thought of death or the dream of death. And it's, it's such a wonderful wake-up call. I love that dream. I had a similar dream not that long ago where I was, I was in an argument with my husband and I was really right. I was really pissed. <laughs> and, and I prayed for guidance the night before for like an, you know somebody do something. And in fact, I, I say, this is, this is written about in my other book, It's All in Your Dreams. I say, that before I went to sleep, instead of saying, you know, God, angels, give me some guidance about what to do, I said, no, just fix it. Just handle it. Good night. There <laughs> you go. Being, being kind of snarky with God. And I had a dream that my husband was a little boy, and I was watching over his shoulder, kind of like an angel would be looking over someone's shoulder. And I was noticing, and he was playing with his toys, and he was so cute, so precious, so innocent. And I was like, oh, my God, he's adorable. Oh, this is so precious to get to see him as a kid. Wow. And then I hear a voice over my shoulder. So it's like an angel over my shoulder that says to me, so why not just try loving him? And I thought, and then I was kind of arguing with the angel, but... In real life, the adult version of him is being kind of an ASS, you know, (laughs) kind of, he doesn't really deserve it. I mean, shouldn't he, and why doesn't he, and, but, 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 and it was like, why not just try loving him? And so I, in the dream, I let the floodgates of my love just come pouring out, regardless of whether or not he deserved it. And I woke up in the morning, and he had this little smile on his face, like a little boy. He looked changed instead of being kind of defensive as he had been looking at me lately he looked like a little boy and it was like it just vanished whatever it was and I don't even remember what we were arguing about but it was like a magic wand got waved and it was indeed fixed whoever was helping from the other side fixed it it was over (laughs) that morning when we woke up boy are you lucky to have that 
Well, I think we all have access to that. I think the, the, the point of that story was that we can set an intention before we go to sleep for help with whatever it is we are struggling with in our lives. Or not even struggling, if we just have a desire to improve an area of our life, if we get really specific about it. I was very specific that I wanted help with this particular area. It wasn't like a general thing like, dear God, make my whole life better. It was, no, I want this area handled. And I was very specific and clear. And I think when, whenever we're clear, I think the universe, God, angels, whoever is listening, goes, okay, all right, let's do it. If we take one step towards them, they take a hundred steps towards us. That's my belief. That is a very good belief to have, and <laughs> boy, people should believe like that more often. <laughs> I had a dream that was probably the weirdest thing in the world, and I remember it clearly to this day because it shook the the absolute foundation I stand on. And I've never, never understood why I had this dream because it was horrible. Um, Mm. Something Mm. happened where my 14-year-old was really little. And at the time, she was a little bit older than what she was in my dream. But something happened and she hit her head or something when we were playing and she was dead. So here I am carrying around my my child's lifeless body, place to place, oh begging somebody, can you please help me? I accidentally killed my kid. Can somebody mm. help me save my kid? Can somebody please help me with my daughter? And everybody oh. would just shut the light off on the porch and shut the door, and oh. nobody would help me. And here I am just sobbing. Here is my lifeless daughter's body, and I am just beside myself. You know, I just want my daughter back. Can somebody just help me? How do I, you know, what do I do? How do I save my baby? Is she dead? Is she gone for real? Can somebody just help me? And nobody would help me. And it was like the most crushing thing I have ever gone through. And my kids are all healthy, beautiful children to this day, you know? Yeah. But why Mm -hmm. would someone dream Ah. something like that? Mm. This is a really important dream. I'm so happy that you brought this up, and thank you so much for sharing it. I think this is, I hope your listeners um, are really listening, because this is, this is important. And this is, this is my perspective, and this is really why I'm in the dream business, mostly because of these kind of dreams that leave people feeling so devastated, so disempowered, and so scared, and really rattling your faith. And this is where I think um, a new perspective comes in. So here's a couple thoughts. In general, and then I'm going to get specific with your dream. In general, our dreams come to us in the service of health and healing. Albert Einstein said that either, either everything is a miracle or nothing is a miracle. That this universe is either friendly or it's not. And the most important question we can ask is, is this universe friendly? And after years of research, his answer that he came up, to, up with was, yes, this universe is friendly. So that means everything, including our dreams, is on our side. So how could a dream like that be on your side? From my perspective, and there's actually been research on nightmares, about how nightmares are helping us to give us, like to show us the worst case scenario so that we could experience it, so we could in in a weird way have a dress rehearsal for how we would handle that situation, should that ever happen, so that we are more prepared and better able to survive should it happen. So in your dream, your daughter did die, and and you were what, running around and nobody was helping you. So how might that be helpful? In some way, there's some. I would imagine if it were my dream, I would there's it would build up some self-reliant aspect. Like what would I do if no one was there to help me? Of course, that wouldn't happen. But in the worst case scenario, you would have to rely on yourself and you would have to figure it out. So this dream would be helping you to figure out more solutions, more resourcefulness than you might ever have had to figure out. Even though the dream didn't end with a happy ending, this is where I also come in because a dream isn't over just because you woke up. We can go in and finish the dream, which we will do hopefully if we have time. But here's the other part of the dream. Well, mothers often have dreams about something really horrible happening to their children because as a mother, it's your, I mean, the father as well. Fathers also have dreams like this about their kids, but primarily mothers because you're the one that births them 
biologically, it is your imperative to keep them alive. So often you'll have dreams where their life is threatened or where they do die so that you have to dig so deep, deeper than you ever would to have to find your strength. So there's there's a blessing in that, and there's something very universal that a lot of mothers, I, w- I bet you if we talked to 100 different mothers, they would all say that in some way, shape, or form that they had a similar dream. But here's the other part of it. From a symbolic perspective, because often, more often than not, our dreams are symbolic, I would look at the dream if it were my dream, and I would say, this is the daughter aspect of self that has died. So... If, if, if we're a mother, usually that means that the younger aspect of ourselves has to die in order to be a good mother. Um, we have to let it, it's like a sacrifice we make. I know a friend of mine, when she had her daughter, said, I used to be the flower, now I'm the soil, and my daughter's the flower. So it's like I'm not this pretty daisy anymore, now I'm just dirt, and my daughter gets all the, the she's the daisy. It's all about watering her and taking care of her. So... In many ways, there is a death that comes from being a good mother. There's some mothers that don't, that are a bit more narcissistic, that focus more on themselves, that don't let their ego die, and they focus on themselves. So in many ways, I would say that the younger aspect of you had to die in order for the mother aspect of you, the champion hero, to come alive. So everyone in the dream is an aspect of ourselves. So it's, it's the you, it's the daughter aspect of you that died. And she hit herself on the head. So that would represent her. She was hit on the head. I didn't hear that part. Did she? She was hit on the head, or how did she die? We were playing, wrestling around, and she hit her head. Okay. So the head is the mental process. The head is where our thoughts are, and our sense of our thought identities about ourselves. So it was like having amnesia about, about, about being this past self. So I would also say that the positive aspect of this dream would also be saying, Be aware, Sue, that the younger aspect of you has died. You might want to resurrect that part of you in your waking life. How can you resurrect that four-year-old, that younger little girl, because I know you're busy working to feed your family, to keep clothes on their back and food on the table. When do you have time to play? When do you have time to take a bath? When do you have time to just do something that's, that's fun for you? I bet not in a long time. I do, because my two younger ones go to their dads and the two older ones are self-sufficient, so I have that time now. Right, now you do, but at the time that you had the dream, I would would assert probably not so much. Nope, I had three girls I was taking care of by myself, so it was constant. Two jobs and, yeah. Exactly, so not a lot of time for your little girl self to play. And so the mother aspect of you is trying to save the little girl part of you and trying to get help. And then also, there's a whole thing about the growing up and really becoming like kind of the rite of passage of really becoming a full-blown warrior, princess, queen, mother, where you are self-reliant. In the dream, no one is there to rescue you or her. So to me, that's a message. Like, what would we do if we were not the damsel in distress, if there was no one that was going to save us and we had to really pick ourselves up by our bootstraps? So there's a message in that. One of the stories in the Chicken Soup for the Soul book is about an ambulance driver. Laura Fredrickson in, in the book talks about how she had always, had, she had always like Scarlett O'Hara, <clears throat> relied on the kindness of strangers. Or is that Blanche Dubois? Blanche Dubois always relied on the kindness of strangers. But in her dream, an ambulance driver, she was trying to get the ambulance driver's attention and they wouldn't listen to her either. And she's crying and screaming. And she woke up from that dream realizing that she had to save herself. So this dream might have been a message to also save yourself. But the last thing I'll say is if you were working with me, if we were going to do a session and we can do a mini version of it right now from the perspective that a dream isn't over just because you woke up, the dream on a parallel plane still exists and you can finish it the way you'd like or rearrange it, if you could do that, how might you change this dream so that it would unfold in a way that gave you power? instead of taking your power away. I would just have somebody help me to, or find a way to bring my daughter back so everything was fine. That's how I would finish it. Okay, okay, cool. So that's one way to do it. So somebody, some some heroic person, so pick somebody. What kind of person would it be? A man, a woman, hero? what What kind of person would it be? I don't know. I 
<clears throat> would think it would just be somebody who was kind and loving and who, you know, would do for others as they would want done to them. That's <clears throat> who I am. <laughs> okay. Okay. So they help to bring her back to life. She's not dead after all. Right. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So that's one way. In, in my world, sometimes I think that we, in, in a dream, of course, we, we would, the, what we would always say is we just wish that, that that whole scene didn't happen, that we were, that something different totally happened. And sometimes one way to work with a dream is to say, well, what if this did happen, but we, because it's a dream, we could do something completely amazing. Like, for example, <clears throat> what if she died and came back but more powerful than before. What if she hit her head and now had a superpower that made her super smart or super telepathic? And what if now, and what if it was your, you know, it could be, what if it was, what if you flew with her into the sky and your dad on the other side helped to, I don't know, it could be so many other things, not just the typical thing that would happen on waking life. But the bottom line is it's what, what gives you power, what makes you feel grateful and happy, um, and it could just be exactly the scene that you made up, or it could be some some addition of that. So something to think about. How would you feel in the dream if you did wake up? Or let's just put it this way: if you were in the dream and it happened the way that it did, but you became lucid in the dream, and then you had a say over how the ending went, so you were able to change it in the way that you described, or some kind person stepped in and helped and helped to re rehabilitate her or resuscitate her. How would you feel if you woke up from the dream at that point? I would have been a lot more at peace <laughs> than leaving it like that. That was a horrible thing. I woke up crying and in real life I was sobbing when I woke up and I was I had to get up immediately, go to a room, mm -hmm. make sure she was breathing. <laughs> right, right, right. So now the focus is on this new ending of the dream because you just gave it a new ending. And so you can meditate on how good that new ending feels. And in some way, <clears throat> if we were looking neurologically at your brain, we would see that a new, new synapse is formed, a new um, groove in your brain from that one place that the thought used to go to, that old ending, it's going into a new place that creates a different feeling. And if you think about that, several times and meditate on that, then that becomes the new reality. It overrides the old, the old point of view, the old dream. And then you can carry that positive feeling into your day. And that can give you some extra juice. That's extra pretty extra awesome. Time. Yeah. The, the other thing that I went through, and I don't <clears> know how to explain this, but nobody in my lifetime has been able to explain this. And it, and it went on for years and it still goes on. When I, sleep sometimes I go to this house and it's a house that I've always gone to and I don't know why I've never seen it in my my mm. life never um mm. when I get to it it's like this flat row like a flat row of house like a I don't know maybe a flat row of apartments but when I get to the door I have the key and I always say to myself the same thing I know I'm not supposed to be here but I have to go in. So I take the key out of my pocket, I unlock the door, and I go in. Well, from the outside, like I said, it's this flat thing that looks like a row of apartments. But when I get in it, it's this big round cylinder type house that's like four stories high. And it's got, it's the, all the walls, all the way around it are nothing but ceramic things, you know, glass things, beautiful things. And it's like there's a spiral staircase that's up against the wall and it kind of follows the wall around. And there's bedrooms that go up all the way around the outside of it. And then if you walk f forward through this swinging door, I have this really huge kitchen with a big, wow. big, huge, you know, center island. All these, you know, beautiful electronic stove, <laughs> refrigerator. Oh, my gosh. And it's amazing. But when and I mean, it smells like it should smell and, you know, wow. for my home. And but when I get there, I always say, I know I'm not supposed to be here, but I have to go in. And the thing is, I revisit this place a lot in my dreams. It's, mm -hmm. It didn't just happen once. Mm -hmm. I go back here a lot. I'll just fall asleep 
whether it's at night or during a nap during the day. And all of a sudden, I'm driving up this driveway right back to my house again. And I'm like, why am I here? I've never seen this place before. And from the outside, it looks nothing like it looks from the inside. So I go, oh my God. And, and it's the same thing. I, I know I'm not supposed to be here. Maybe I didn't pay my rent or something. I don't know why I say I'm not supposed to be here, but that's, mm. I know I'm not supposed to be here by law, but I have to be here. There's something that tells me that I have to be here. And when I yeah. walk in the door, it's my, it's, it's a whole new world that's mine. And the the crazy wow. thing is, this has been going on since I think the first dream I had like this. I was eight or nine, and I still revisit this place at forty four. Oh, Sue, I love this. Okay, I just want to bring attention to this, and I love it. At the beginning of our interview, you said, "Well, I don't dream," and so far on the show, you've shared you've shared three really big dreams. No, I mean, so- I, I don't dream like I used to. I used to remember pretty much <laughs> all of my dreams. And these days, I, it seems I'm not remembering. Not as often. Not right. as often. I just think it's fun because I often will talk to people that say, I don't, I don't remember dreams. And then they'll tell me about these massive dreams. I'm like, oh, no, those are dreams. And you remembered them and you still remember them. So it's still, I think most of us think that we don't remember dreams regularly, but when, once we start talking about them, they start coming in. It's like the floodgates are open and we start remembering, and then that also takes our ability to start remembering them more now. So I bet you you'll start, you'll be back on the track of, of remembering them more just as a result of this conversation. I hope. Let me know. And also, do you know Rolanda Watts? She used to have the Row Show, um, a TV show on, on network TV and radio show. I don't. I've never heard anyway, that name. Rolanda Watts, look her up. She also, I think you two live next door to each other in your dreams. She said almost exactly verbatim what you just told me, that there's a house that she always visits in her dream. It's beautiful. She thinks she's not supposed to be there, but she can't help but be there. It's gorgeous. She loves it. It's opulent. It's amazing. And <laughs> so just know that you maybe you guys are next door neighbors in, a, in this other world. That's crazy. So, I didn't know anybody <laughs> else dreamed like me. <laughs> yes. So... Carl Jung, the late great father of psychotherapy, he actually dreamt about another house. And once he started to be aware that this house was a a recurring place, it, it, it had a reality to it. There was stable structures that he could go back to and always see. He started to go beyond the house to the neighborhood, and he started to notice that there was an actual neighborhood that surrounded this house, and there was a school and a mailbox and a post office and a grocery store and people, and pretty soon he realized, this is a real place. This is an actual place that has a reality to it, and it was a place in his dream. There was no place, whatever the town was called, it wasn't a place that existed on planet Earth, but it was a place that had a stability to it in the dream reality. And there's now, he, you know, there's a lot of people that actually really have another life and another place that they live in. And I wonder in some way, and, I, and this would be the place of curiosity that I would, in, I would um, invite you to explore the why you're not supposed to be there. And it might be because it's in another reality and because you might stay there or you might have a hard time coming back here. But let's just look at it like it's a metaphor. Um, Even though I think this dream is in some ways very literal, um, meaning that there is an actual house that you are going to, and it's 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 a place that's yours. As a metaphor, a house represents our body, it represents our mind, and it represents, so if it's in good shape, in some ways, your house is... It's like they can't judge a book by its cover. The outside of it looks kind of ordinary, kind of flat, but the inside is majestic. So in some way, I'd say, how is that true about you? How how might you appear to be kind of ordinary-ish on the outside? Not so ordinary, but to yourself you think you're ordinary. But really, on the inside, you're opulent. You're amazing. And there's so much to explore. And you smell good, and it's just cylindrical and beautiful and like wow really like a like who you really are that's the truth that's the truth because what's on the outside what people see is not Uh nearly what's on the inside if i could explode and just be everything (laughs) i am inside holy cow would it be huge and people would be on their knees they'd be kissing your toes they'd be like oh my god sue no i don't see my follow you i don't see myself that way at all i just i'm somebody who is not i don't 
I'm not a me person. I'm an everybody around me person. The only thing I care about me is that I get the affection and the love that I need. And that's me. Right. That's something I'll fight to the death for because you know what? That's what I require. I don't require mm, what any money respect. does. You know, right. well, it's just the people around me that I, that love me. I want the affection, yeah. the hugs, the kisses, the I love you. Those are the things that matter to me the most in the world. But right. wow, you know, you're right. If I opened up the inside of who I am inside, it would explode like a pistol. <laughs> right, but what a what a great <clears throat> talk about a self esteem booster that nothing else in this world could give you. I mean, I could give you millions of dollars, and that would be lovely, <clears throat> but nothing could really give you the sense of your internal reality, your interior sense of self, than the stream. You are this opulent being. The house is a metaphor for who you are. You've got resources that you didn't even realize you had. You're more majestic, more beautiful than you realize you have. And it is yours. You have the key. And maybe the reason why you have that, and if it were my dream, I would, I would think this. I would think the reason I'm not supposed to go there is because there's a gap between where I normally live and where this place is, or where, like the... Often, like, on, if, if we're looking at it just vibrationally, if I'm used to vibing at, like, let's say on a scale of 1 to 10, at, like, a 3, and this house represents a 9, then there would be some sense of, well, I don't belong here. This isn't, this is too much for me, too big for me. So I'm out of my league in some way. But, but in some way, no, this is yours. So maybe it's just because the vibration is a little bit, there's a differential between your normal vibration and this vibration. But it could be, if it, if it were my dream, I would see it as a challenge to raise to that vibration in my ordinary life. Even if nothing changes visually, you can have your internal vibration raise higher. That's the name of the game. When your vibration is higher, actually, it is life changes around you. So to me, that would be like the the meditation. Meditate on having this house be... Having, having it be okay that I access this house. It's okay that I come here because I belong here and it's mine. Well, what I feel, I mean, the way I was before, I was somebody who was a queen of my own castle. You know what? Things were my mm. way. I had, I was raising kids by myself and the people in and out of my life. You know what? It's my way and things are going to be my right. way. If you don't like it, the door hits you on the way out. Keep going. And, you know, <laughs> right. I it, yes. it's because I was a mother. I had two jobs. Mm -hmm. I had kids and I had, you know, it was up to me to keep the roof over their heads and keep everything going. And I had to be on top of everything. It wasn't a control issue. It was, I knew life my, and death. I'm sorry, what? Was it life and death? Like, it, was it was life and death. Those are my kids. Right. And I have to do what it takes to make sure that everything runs smoothly in my right. home. So right. that's how, you know, 99% of my life was, I'm, you know what, this is how it's going to be. If you don't like it, then walk away. And, and when I shut a door, it's closed. But mm -hmm. I'm not used to somebody else trying to, you know, I'm not a control worrier. I don't need that kind of control. But if things are not the way that they need to be, with my family, you know, with me and my kids, it, it, it has to be or I'm not, it's not going to happen. Well, I'm right. not that way anymore because things are different in my life now where I don't have that kind mm. of, you know, queen of my throne and, you know, mm. things are going to be this way so that, and, and like I said, you know, a mother knows exactly what I'm talking about. Things have right. to run accordingly so that nothing falls down around her, especially when she's the one raising her kids pretty much alone. And you, right. you have to be the king and the queen, the mother and the father. And, you know, right. when people right. come in and out of your life, they have to realize, look, this is how it's going to be here. And it, I've right. always been that way. I've always been on top of everything. I worked two jobs. My kids still were fed. My, st my kids still were clothed. I did not go and ask any public agency for any help, you know, right. I, for cash or anything. I was never that kind of person. Wow. And I think, wow. you know, when my life kind of switched around a little bit, and I'm kind of faced with people around me that, you know, it's the, the people are different. The circumstances are different. My dad's gone now. And, mm -hmm. you know, now it's it's kind of a lot of trying to I want to help my mom. My mom's ready to go her way in her life with their own place mm -hmm. to live. I'm ready to get out of this state with my family mm -hmm. and go have a no different place to live. But it's still, you know, I know what's within me that I that has to be there in order for me to shine like the human being I am. 
And that, right. that human being, it's not a control issue as people think it is. It's I have to be in control of what's going on with my family. It's my responsibility and I have to do this this way. And then right. when you have other people that come into your life and their ways are different or they're not quite exactly what yours are, there's that power mm -hmm. struggle. And it's for me, it's, <laughs> it's not struggling for power. It's this is how I've done it. Since my, right. my first daughter was born at 21, I know how life mm. has to be in order for things to be okay with my family. So, right. you know, that part of me is not shining mm. anymore because that part of me is not allowed to say, look, this is how it's going to be because it has to be this way. So because of those, you know, things that are not in place in my life, my life is actually falling apart in a lot of ways in which mm. needs to be rebuilt. <laughs> and well, maybe this dream is um, is kind of... It's like a, a North Star that if you really inhabit this dream, the energy of it, the juice of it, then then things change. I always think that I'm, one day I'm going to write a book called The Lazy Girl's Rules of Life or Ways, Rules of Manifesting because I think if we get a really powerful dream like yours in this house and we embody the energy of it so much that our circumstances will change to match our vibration. <laughs> There's a, a woman. Do you mind if I tell a little a little crazy story? Absolutely about that? not. Talk away. I love it. I, I love mean, your story. It's, it's a little bit. I mean, it's a different kind of a story than what what we're talking about here, but it relates. So, this woman, and she's going to be in the in the next book, the Dreams and Synchronicities Chicken Soup for this whole book. Um, her, she was diagnosed with brain cancer, and. Um, and she, I didn't know this at the time, but she sent me a. She said that she had a dream where she was floating and smiling, and really and really happy. And I, and I said, well, I the, this dream doesn't need to be interpreted, but I would just meditate on the feeling of it every day for five minutes. So she emails me six months later and says, Kelly, I'm I'm the woman who was smiling big and floating dream. Do you remember me? And she said, I, what you didn't know at the time was that I was diagnosed with brain cancer and I had nothing to smile about, nothing was, nothing to, to feel light about. My life was so heavy and so out of control, such chaos that this dream was so strange because it made me feel so good. It's, it was such an anomaly in my life. That's why I, I contacted you. <clears throat> she said, but I did everything that you said. I paid attention to that dream every day. I meditate on it for at least five minutes a day. And it's six months later and my brain cancer is gone. And my doctors, my oncologists, they are scratching their heads saying, how did this happen? You haven't been on chemo. You haven't been on radiation. Like, where did it go? And she said, the only thing that I know that I've done is meditate on the feeling, this high vibrational feeling of floating and smiling so big. I feel like it's changed things. And her life has continued to get better. She met a really great man. She moved to a beautiful house. Her body is healthy. She's happy. It's like, and she attributes it to this personalized meditation that she has that came to her directly from her dream that she uses every day. The dream isn't over just because she woke up. The dream energy has become stronger and more vibrant in her life, and she continues to meditate on it. So I would say if, if your situation were mine, I would say this dream about this opulent house, I would meditate on how good it feels to be in that house and to know that it's mine, and I have the key in my pocket. It's mine. I own it and to meditate on how good that feels. I would meditate on that for a few minutes a day and notice how vibrationally that changes things. And once that becomes normal, that feeling of being in that house and owning that house and, and all of that, when that becomes normal, I bet you the circumstances around you will shift. They will have to in some way. Just as a, um, a black belt in karate who really knows their power they don't have to go around trying to micromanage everybody and control everybody because they sit back with a smile on their face knowing they're in control. They're in so much control that they don't have to do anything about it because they know how powerful they are. They can allow things to be however they are because they, they've got the power. So we can relax a little bit more when we really own the power. Where we're scary, where we act, where we get ourselves in trouble is when we think we don't have the power, and we run around trying to establish it when, when it's really not our place to do it. So I think your dream 
is a miracle, and I think I'm going to borrow it. <laughs> Feel <laughs> free. On that. Even if you don't, I'll borrow it from you. That's kidding. I, I think, I don't know, I used to have a lot of crazy, you know, a lot of empowering dreams in my past. I haven't had them in years. I don't dream that way anymore. Like I said, I barely remember my dreams, and if I do, they're absolutely stupid dreams. Um, no, don't say that. I think every dream is a good dream, even if it seems completely ridiculous. And I am the queen of ridiculous dreams. But if you know, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Don't call it stupid. Like, be respectful of your dreams. Don't call it silly. You know, you could say this is wild. I don't understand this. But, but it's genius. There's genius that comes through. Well, one of the stupidest the ones I had, um, Friday the 13th, I love horror movies. Watched them my whole life since I was little. My brother was the king of scare the hell out of me. <laughs> every night in my life and I mean he oh, was the, there's nobody who can scare people like my brother scared me I, I slept <laughs> oh, on my God. parents bedroom floor for in a sleeping bag for a lot of years because I refused to win my room I'm so oh my not God, kidding you poor baby. and you know it was just that's my brother that's his sense of humor and he now does it to my children in which my 21 year old is getting pretty good at it and I'm so proud <laughs> but um I had a dream one night that Jason from Friday the 13th is chasing me through my backyard. And it's of my course. backyard of where I grew up in the same house I'm in. And he's chasing me through the backyard. And, uh, you know, I'm petrified and I'm running and I'm crying. Please don't kill me. Then it hits me in the head. And I stop running. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? I don't know what you're chasing me for. I said, but if you spare my family and stop killing people, then I'll marry you. I said, let's just go in the house. Let's just go in the what? house and have a cup of coffee and talk about this. And Jason doesn't talk. So we're sitting in the living room or we're sitting in the kitchen. And I said, I don't know how you take your coffee, buddy, but black is all I got. So I hand him a cup of coffee and I said, look, we'll just do the marriage things right now. We'll do the vows. I'll marry you as long as you just stop killing people because it's senseless and you're killing other people's loved ones. And he nods his head so he drinks his coffee and I woke up just I'm laughing and I'm like wow Sue you gotta stop dreaming cause this is absolutely crazy so I told my brother and my brother's like yep he says this and this is why I don't have any sisters it's all I could say <laughs> And I don't know why I dreamt such a crazy thing, but in my dream, I mean, I tame the beast. Sue, <laughs> I think I need to write my next dream book about just you and your dreams. I got a lot These more are... than that. <laughs> oh, my God, I'm going crazy over this dream. This is the best. This is the best. This is exactly what to do with our scary chasing dreams. Um, the most vividly remembered dreams. Most people remember their chasing dreams. When people say, well, what's the most commonly remembered dreams? It's chasing dreams. And most people do, they don't do what you so cleverly did. They wake up before they have any direct interaction with the person. And sometimes, I, you know, I tell people, ask the person, like if you can have the presence of mind to ask them why they're chasing you. Often they will surprise you. Well, he can't and, talk, and so there was nothing he was he going to say. And, no, but in the dream, he can transmit a message. He right. can telepathically tell you something, but you cleverly knew what he wanted. He wanted to marry you, and so he didn't have to kill people. So this is exactly what to do with our shadow dreams. So from one perspective, Carl Jung, and I totally believe this, he says that everybody in our dream is an aspect of ourselves, and when... And, who we're being chased by is our shadow. It's, it's everything that we, in our ego waking state, claim to not be. So you know that Whitney Houston, Chaka Khan song, I'm Every Woman, It's All in Me? You know that song? you got to know that one. Yes. I'm every woman. Yep, <laughs> I know it. <laughs> it's all in me. Yep. <laughs> so we're everything. We're either everything or nothing. So we're everything. That means that we are the good, the bad, the savior, the killer, the, the narcissist, the generous, the Mother Teresa, the, the you know, we're, we're all of it. But we, are, in our waking identity, we say, I'm just going to be the good things. And that's a good thing that we identify ourselves with being good, kind, generous, caretaking, but we also shove that greedy, selfish, what I want part in the closet. And that's the part that comes to call in these chasing dreams. And if we embrace those parts, we realize they're not so bad, they're just turned up 10 notches too high. But if we, are, if we, if we do what I call my fear formula, 
what F-E-A-R stands for, exactly what you did, face it, embrace it, ace it, and replace it. So face it, you turn and face the scary thing, what you did. Embrace it, okay, I'll marry you, I'll embrace you, I'll hug you, you are a part of me that I know I can't, I can run but I can't hide, you will always be there, let me at least embrace you and learn about you, let me be curious about you and see what might be good about you. You didn't do that part in the dream, you just kind of went, you're a bad dude but I don't want you to kill people so I'll marry you. So there's still work left to be done in this dream. I would say embrace it from the perspective of let's be curious. What is good about Jason? You know, he's single-minded focused. He's he's ruthless. Yeah, you know, he's single-minded focused on killing people. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, but in some way, killing in a dream anyway is about getting rid of. I had a killer chase me in a dream, and I realized in the dream you're chopping away, just like in Buddhism, they have a lot of gory images of chopping, and it's often about chopping the heads off of ignorance, chopping off of the lack of love so that only love remains, getting rid of that which is dead weight that isn't, isn't serving you. So death in a dream could be a very positive thing. It can be about radical transformation so that you're no longer indulging in the dead weight of the stuff that keeps you murky. Well, in my my walk with life now, that's what I'm doing is I'm trying to get rid of the negative in my life that's not anything Mm -hmm. that's going to benefit me. And I'm not a selfish Mm. person, but I have to stop now and think, I got four girls and what, what goes on around me, I want them to grow up with a normal life. And, you know, so it's kind of getting the people out of my life that are, you know, poison and getting the people in my life who are positive and loving. And you know what, if, if, if that means being me and, and saying this is how it's got to be in order to think, I've always been somebody who everybody comes to for relationship advice. And you know what? <laughs> I'm told a lot of times that, you know, I do know what a relationship needs. And the one thing mm-hmm. that it needs is you can't have selfishness between you. You can't have me, me, me. You can't be self-centered. You have to give all you have and the other person give all they have and nobody's left out. And I don't know why people in this day and age don't get that. When they're all about them, there's no room for it to ever be about the other person. And I see it all the time. I have friends come to me all the time. You know, my relationship's not working. I don't get anything I need from him. I don't get affection. I don't get sex. I don't get anything. And it's like, Mm. you know, but everything he wants, I'm always there. I get his coffee. I make his dinner. I do this and that. But when I want something, it's never about me. Well, if these people would stop and realize that if we made it about each other, nobody would ever go without anything. And I do not understand why everybody is in such a self-centered nature these days where they don't see past the end of their nose. I have a friend who comes to me all the time and I have to tell her the same thing. Going to find sex or something in another man because you're not finding it in your man is not the answer. You right. know, no, you to cheat on the guy you're with and just to go home to him to the same emptiness that you had. And that's why the reason why you did what you did is not mm. the answer. You know what? You guys mm. got to figure this out. If it's not going to work, then go find somebody who's going to give you what you need or is going mm. to be that equal partner with you. I said to cheat mm. on him is just deceiving him. Talk mm. to him about it. Sit down and say, look, this is how I feel. Nine out of ten mm. times, the partner doesn't know that they're not giving what the other partner needs because nobody says anything. Or you can pray for a dream to reveal something else or something new. I find that in after doing so much dream work, there's it's really hard to not see this waking world as a dream as well. This this world that we are in right now is also very dreamlike, and if we change something from a dream perspective, in the dream, the dream changes radically. And in this three-dimensional world that we're in, things don't change quite as quickly, but we do change things. When we change, they change. I was having yet another little tiff with my husband, and we were standing in our bathroom, and we were and I, and I know that he is a reflection of an aspect of me. If we were dreaming, he's the husband aspect of me. And we were having an argument in the bathroom, and I looked in the mirror as we were fighting, and then I remembered, he is the mirror. He is my mirror. So whatever I was yelling at him about, I was yelling at myself about, because he is the aspect of me that I was upset with. 
and I started cracking up because it's like it's such a it's so true. We are mirrors of each other. So if we treat this is one thing I think if we treat life like it's a dream, then I think things go better. We don't have to blame each other for anything. If we take if we do a lot of the work internally, people do change. Just like the woman who woke up from her dream who we write about in Chicken Soup for Their Soul Dreams and Premonitions about her husband he didn't he didn't change he didn't do anything different she changed her point of view changed and then he reflected that change back to her in their renewed relationship because she it's like if one of us changes the other one has to and if they don't then they go away that's right you, great, you just get that's when you know that you need that person just does not belong in your life Right, and you don't necessarily, with, with, I mean, this is a whole different topic, but I know John Gray talks about this, that men often don't want us to do all those little things for them. They want to feel like the man that provides for us. So if we're doing everything for them, they, and we think that we're being such a good, such a good wife, in some way we're kind of emasculating them, and they're not inspired to, to, to be our hero. So we've got to be smart about how we are in our relationships. It's not so cut and dry. And it is about, I mean, in many ways, I think we, if we take care of ourselves and we have an overflow to give, then our partner feels like they, I know that if I'm happy and, I, and my happiness has nothing to do with my husband, it's because I just had a great interview with Sue Brown. He's going to look at me and he's going to take credit for that. He's going to feel like he's the man because I'm happy. I'm his wife. And I'm and I'm happy. He's got a happy wife, and some way he's happy about that. Because, but it really, I've been with Sue. I'm just happy because I've been doing what makes me happy in my life, right. and he gets credit for it. And in some ways, that's okay. He can take credit for that because he's giving me the space to do it. He's supporting me in doing this. So in many ways, it is about giving to each other. I think, but it's also about making sure that the core of us is well taken care of, so that we can support so that we can bring a happy person to our marriage, not a, why aren't you ever talking to me? Where are you going? You never touch me. That's just like, who wants to touch that? I don't know. There's there's a lot more. That'll, that'll be another book, Sue. So you and I can write that book. That would be a lot of fun. Trust me, I would love it. <laughs> um, the, there's an, the other dream that I wanted to talk to you about was uh, when I lost my grandfather, and I don't really remember much for the next two months, like I said, um, that was probably the most devastating moment in my life. What I did remember in that was, um, I think I was sleeping, but I'm not sure because I don't remember what was going on around me. But I was out of school, already great. I, I was taking cosmetology. I was trying to finish up my thousand hours, but I was done with high school. In mm-hmm. my dream, I continually, continually ended up um, at the school sitting inside the doors on the floor, waiting for the bus to come. I got on the bus. I went to BOCES for my cosmetology class. I don't remember anything I did there until it was time to get on the bus, come back, sit outside, wait for my bus to take me home. And I don't remember going home. But this, I repeated this for like two months straight, the same over and over dream. And other than that, I didn't have any kind of a life. I I didn't have any memories of anything else. So in real life, you were going to cosmetology school. Not not for those two months. I took that time off for because of what was going on with my my grandfather. With your so. grandfather, so, but you dreamt about the kind of bookending the moments, like waiting for the bus to t- to take you to cl- school and then waiting for it to take you back home. So but I don't remember the- anything in between. I don't remember going to the class and the dream. I don't remember any of it. It was just the waiting. What does a bus What does a bus represent to you? What does a bus mean to you? Like if I was an alien and had no idea what a bus was. I don't know. I wondered that myself. What symbolizes getting on that bus? I can remember the bus trip and I can remember sitting in the hall waiting. So I tried to figure out for the life of me why I kept going back to that one place in time for two months straight. And I had nothing else to even, I I don't remember. My mom's like, you came out, you got something to eat. I'm like, what? This stuff is Mm. gone. The only thing I was living in my head was that specific thing over and over. Other than that, Mm. nothing. And I I don't know if my, I, I, I kept saying to my mom, I'm having a nervous breakdown where I'm not remembering anything. I said, but I'm constantly was in this haze that whole time. I don't remember anything. She told me I did. Wow. Wow. Wait, so, it, but you would dream about this waiting for the bus. Just constantly. That's all so I in, did. In 
some way, if you know, if it were my dream, and you tell me how this resonates with you, a bus as as opposed to a car. Did you actually take a bus? Was the bus part of your reality? Yeah, at that time? for cosmetology, you had to take a bus to both these. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there is a reality that there was an actual bus, but a bus to me represents going going where the people go, going going somewhere. A vehicle is a metaphor, like even a car represents your career. It's a vehicle for your that's transporting you through your life, getting you through. And you are waiting. It's like anytime we're waiting, we're parked, we're not going somewhere, it's like we feel idle. We feel like we're not in the driver's seat. We're not we're not in control, but we're waiting for something to happen. We're and sometimes waiting is is fine. It, it just to me it represents that you were kind of in an in between stage where you weren't completely plugged in, weren't completely in the driver's seat. You you were kind of waiting to go with the flow of everything else. Um, so to me that was like kind of waiting at a bench, parked, waiting. Um, it's it's like you know waiting for life to happen, waiting for your waiting for your life to kick in, and it hadn't kicked in yet. So well, when that's, he when he had passed, and I astro projected up there and saw everything happen. My dad came back and he said, your grandfather, he was crying when he woke me up. He said, your grandfather just had a heart attack. They don't think he's going to make it. And I said, he didn't have a heart mm. attack. I said, the main artery to his heart clogged and he was dead before he even hit the, the chair. And my dad's mm. like, how do you know that? And I said, because I was there. And mm. then I went in, mm. um, I called my, my, friend's, my best friend's mom at the time and I told her what happened. And she went and got her daughter from school and her she called her son from work and they both came over and... They were here and, you know, that was my best friend, Penny, and she never left my side. She was here all the time when we weren't in school. And, you know, that night went before we went to sleep, that was actually the last time I remember anything for a couple months. But my grandfather was sitting on the edge of my bed and I looked over and I said, Penny, do you see him? And she said, yep, I do. And my grandfather looked at me and he said, don't shed a tear for me. Where I am, there's no such thing as pain. He said, I just want you to, to know that I'm okay. And oh he disappeared. God. Well, before mm-hmm. that, my I was there when my friend Penny's dad passed at her house. And mm. we were in the bedroom that was next door to their room. And the the last thing you heard before the ambulance sirens w- were going off was he said to her mother, I think I just about had it. And, his, and her mom said that he reached down to pull up the covers and he never even made it. He was dead. And uh, he had had cancer wow. for a while. But... You know, wow. I had, in over the years with her, I had seen her father in the mirror a million times. We're in the bathroom that conjoins oh, with his wow. bedroom. So I would be standing there, and we would be doing our makeup so we could go out to a dance club. And I would look up in the mirror and yell at her brother, stop looking at me in the mirror and go away. And then I'd look up again and say, holy cow, that is not her brother. And I would uh, yell for her, and when she came there, she could see him standing there in the mirror too, but when we turned around, he wasn't there. Wow. So wow. I experienced her passing You're... with her dad as well. And mm. so when my grandfather passed, she could see my grandfather the same. My God. Well, that's pretty special friendship you and Penny have. I think that's amazing. Going back to the dream in many ways, I think that when somebody that we are really close to is is making their transition, I think sometimes we feel like we have to put our life on pause, on hold, that while they're not among the living, we can't be. It almost feels like a betrayal of them. So in many ways, you were kind of, you were in pause mode. You were not really among the living during that time because you were kind of joined with That's how I felt, yes. In solidarity in a way. As um, as showing your support, and in, and in some ways, I think that's that's beautiful. And in other ways, I think the 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 one on the other side would be saying, or the one who's preparing would say, your life is precious too. You, just because I'm dying doesn't mean you have to. And I know you love me to live your life. But I think you were, you really needed to be connected to your grandfather during that time while he was passing away, so you could see what was happening and it was good for your development sometimes it's good for us to just kind of pause this world and and go deeper into the other world i agree i think i think if it wasn't for what i went through with his passing like i said i don't think i would have handled my dad's death at all i mean if it wasn't for the man i was with and am with i i know for a fact that that day would not have been okay um 
he was my rock and he, the fact that he was there with me the passing of my father was you know the support and, and the love that he gave me in my dad's passing was wow. just just an amazing mm. I, I can't even explain it and I know for a fact I would have not made it through that day as well as I did if he wasn't here that would have just oh, been a wow. hard day but I think wow. that I think we're given so many things to learn from. I mean, now I know that when it's my mom's time, I'm going to be okay yeah. because I've already right. done this. When it's my mom's time, I will sit beside her bed or beside her chair wherever she passes until she takes her last breath and I will be okay. And you can pass that wisdom on to your girls. And so I'm they hoping... Can, they can pass it on to their girls and so on and so on and so on. Well, I'm hoping that the fact that they were able to sit beside my father at his passing, that they're going to be okay when it does come around again. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, and especially you're their rock. So if you... I always think, you know, I don't have, I don't have my own kids. I've got stepkids and I've got a niece. And I'm, I'm a godmother to a lot of kids. And I, I always think that with the parents of the kids, if, the, if you, the mom, are okay, then they're going to be okay. If you're freaking out, then they're freaking out. So really, if you come to peace, then that teaches them more than, more than anything. That's my observation. I have a friend named Kelly, and she, uh, I hung out with her a lot when we were teenagers. We used to go dancing together, and she was just an amazing human being. You know, she was one that would never judge anybody, and she was just a kind, loving person, and I absolutely loved her. And I was looking for her a lot in the last few years. You know, probably the last 10 years I was trying to find her on Facebook. I'm like, I wonder whatever happened to Kelly. And mm. I got a message on my Facebook. Um, somebody was trying to friend request me, and he claims it's because I was beautiful or something, which I don't care because <laughs> I don't pay attention to that, but... <laughs> I clicked on it to see if it was somebody about my show, and that's usually the only people I really deal with are about my show. And mm -hmm. when I clicked on it, the whole timeline across, you know, with the big picture that's behind the little yeah. picture was a yeah. picture of her grave with her name on it. And oh what? my gosh, did that not take me? I, I just, I sat there and she had gotten killed in a car accident in 1994 and I never heard about oh this. So here gosh. I am and I'm just, wow. I'm sitting there and I'm just looking at this headstone with her name on oh. it and I'm just like, oh, and I, I'd been thinking about her a lot in the last few months and I'm thinking, you know what? I miss Kelly. You know, she always made you smile and she was an angel with a naughty devil side, but it was never, <laughs> a, she, she didn't have a mean bone in her body and she was so sweet. And I just loved the time we were together. You know, we traded yeah. clothes, we traded shoes, we got ready together, yeah. did each other's hair and we just always laughed and she could, she, oh. she would never hurt a human being. She had a heart like mine. So mm. her and I always were, you know, we had that that friendship together and we just we loved being around each other and I had been thinking mm -hmm. about her so much in the last probably six months and when that popped up there I just sat there for the longest time and I'm just thinking to myself how how do I process this she's she's dead is she really dead is this a joke wow. how did this person yeah. find me and know that I was looking for Kelly how did this specific person come across my name on accident my God, it was wow. Well, you know, this is a perfect story to to go into the chicken soup for the soul dreams and synchronicity story. So, if you or your listeners want to submit a story, just go to chickensoup.com dot com and go down to the submit your story button and and send it in. It would be this is beautiful and it's, and you're talking to Kelly right now in California and hopefully this will encourage you to move to California. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm telling you, I do not want to be in New York too much more. I'm the taxes, uh, the it's all crazy here. I'm ready for a relocation. I'm thinking well, of come going to Cali. <laughs> well, I'm thinking, you know, we've been talking about Pennsylvania and stuff like that. It's just here the taxes, it's like they tax you for breathing, they tax you for thinking. They've it's like <laughs> the thinking police, right? Well, what oh my what God. blows my mind is you're going to a secondhand shop to buy something that somebody already paid tax on when they bought it. Why am I going to pay? tax again on something that's already been taxed 
Oh my goodness. And these... Ooh, Sue, I've got another interview that's coming up in a second. I sorry, I don't need That's to... okay. I would love oh to have goodness. you back we... on because we got so much I would more love to talk to. about. I know, we just got started. We're just warming up. That's right. So you'll definitely have to come back on if you would. I would so love to. That would You're be amazing. awesome. We'll have to get together will... and set up another interview. That would be awesome. That would be so awesome. Thank you so much for having well, me. I thank, you thank you for sharing you. your dreams. I want to thank you. And I think you need you. a book. I want to thank you so much for taking your busy schedule time to come and, and talk with us. This was absolutely amazing, and I absolutely love mm. chatting with you. Oh, what a pleasure. This has been a dream. I feel like I've known you forever. Me too. And Isn't that crazy? I know. I know. I love that you shared your dreams. You've got, you're such a beautiful dreamer. And I got a million powerful. more. I got a million more. Oh, my more. God. <laughs> and hopefully this will prime the pump so you and your listeners will start dreaming even, even more so starting now. Not that you're not, it won't enhance your dreams. It will enhance your dream recall because they're all so powerful, even the ones that seem so silly. Well, thank you very much, and you have a great day, and I'm looking forward to having you back on soon. Thank you so much, Sue. My pleasure. Have a beautiful and dreamy day. Thank you, too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. That was a lot of fun, guys. I have to honestly tell you that that was fun. Um, chatting about dreams and stuff is something I really love to do. And, you know, I would love, love to share my dreams in her books and write a book with her. That would be an absolute dream come true by itself. Um so you guys definitely go on and, and check her out. She is absolutely amazing. She is just a lot, a lot, a lot of fun. Um, definitely, you guys. Well, that's all we have time for today. Um, we post our shows on YouTube, and if you want to know more about our upcoming guests and our upcoming shows, please visit Info to Rail webpage. Just Google Info number 2 Rail and click on our Google Sites page. Um, I want to thank you guys, each and every one of you, for being here and listening and the support. Um, you're all amazing. And if it wasn't for the guests and the listeners, I would not be able to do what I have so much fun doing. It's interviews like these that, you know, they they put a whole new joy and a whole new spin on life. And uh, these two I did today, these two interviews were absolutely amazing. And I grew and I learned and I have more more joy in my heart now than I did before I did them. So thank you. Um, we hope to see you here each and every week. We got a lot of great interviews coming with a lot of unique and amazing guests. So we hope you join us back here for every one. May God bless you and keep you, and may his face shine upon you in these uncertain times. We'll see you soon.